Wow, 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 wow. Where I come from, we say ish, 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 ish. What a welcome, what a welcome. I'm very deeply touched. But then I'm not surprised because when I got the invitation to come and be with you in this amazing church, I went online, of course, to see what kind of people you were. And uh, there was a picture of this church, and on the, the tower above the entrance were these amazing words. Imagine a place where your story is sacred, a place where diversity is celebrated, a place where resistance is faithful, a place where God is love. And I said to myself, that's my kind of church. So thank you for having me here amongst you. Uh, it makes me feel like I used to feel getting up in the pulpit of the Central Methodist Mission in Johannesburg and looking out on a, a congregation of people whose presence was an act of defiance. In a nation which refused to allow people to be together, they came together. And they said, this is what it means to be church. And this is what South Africa could be like if we only allowed our future instead of our past, God's future instead of our past, to govern who we were. Well now, friends, following Jesus is not supposed to be boring. Did you know that? If it is, then check your Jesus, because you may have a fake. The real thing brings all sorts of surprises. And Paul and Silas and their party found this out at Philippi. They had had an effective few weeks there, helped by the conversion of a businesswoman called Lydia, and they'd baptized her whole family, and her home had become their headquarters, and from there they went out to the same place every day to preach the good news of the risen Christ. Then all of a sudden, things went pear-shaped. And there followed a series of events so bizarre as to be almost unbelievable. Whoever wrote up this account, and we understand it was Luke, should have ended with the words, oh boy, you, you had to be there. You just had to be there. <laughs> if you don't believe me, you had to be there. It all started with a stalker, a person prone to bursting out with prophetic utterances. And we're told that she possessed a gift, but maybe the gift possessed her. If so, she was twice possessed because she was a slave and her male owners prostituted her spirituality as surely as any pimp would have prostituted her body. Of course, people have been prostituting religion for a very long time. This is my 52nd visit to your country. And I want to tell you, it's hard work flying across 17 hours of Atlantic Ocean to get here. And I used to always wake up at about 3 a.m. with jet lag, of course, in some hotel room after I'd arrived. And switch on the TV and there was the silver-haired guy uh, I think his name was Tilden or something. And he would put, you know, the palm of his hand up like that. And he would tell me if only I put my palm on the television screen and touched his hand, I'd be healed of whatever it was that he knew I had. As long as my other hand was writing a check. We know that kind of religious abuse. And this woman was stalking Paul's group. And she was shouting all the time. And she was saying, these men are servants of the living God, declaring the way of salvation. These men are servants of the living God, declaring the way. Well, you know, I think Paul and Silas probably felt quite good about that for a while. But she never stopped. 
at all. And Paul may have exorcised that spirit inside her out of compassion, but that's not what we're told. Paul was human like anybody else. The main reason may have been to shut her up. And that's when things went pear-shaped. And there are a number of lessons that we can learn from the drama that followed. I love the way Scripture is so contextual and so up-to-date. Listen, if you ask, how does casting a demon out of a deranged slave girl lead to the deepest dungeon in Philippi, the answer is, follow the money. Wherever the gospel acts in the world, not talks, but acts, it will collide with vested interests because it always challenges the powers. And the powers are mainly about money. They always are. Whatever Paul's motives, when he took the pain out of this girl's tortured mind, he also took money out of her owner's pockets. And that meant trouble. It wasn't the first time that Paul had offended big business. In Ephesus, his preaching of the one supreme God threatened the silversmiths who used to make their money out of the worship of the sex goddess, Diana. And so they hounded him out of town, and he was lucky to get away with his life. And now he was offending the hucksters of his day who profited from religious gullibility. And either way, it was about money. It still is. And although there are more religious hucksters, I think, per square mile in this country than anywhere else in the world, uh, these days, these days, there's something far more sinister and dangerous going on. We know that a whole slab of the more gullible religious population of America has been hijacked by the worst pimps of all. Politicians who worship at the altar of the dead idols of race and tribe and money. Our conservative brothers and sisters, many of whom are just good people, they've been fooled. And we are, we are witnessing a massive co option of conservative Christianity in this country in the service of an ideology that cares nothing for religion and everything for power and privilege. I gave a lecture last week at Princeton University where I was told that well-known right-wing funders are pouring money onto that campus, onto conservative religious student societies. They want more Supreme Court Judges like the one most recently, the one but one most recently appointed. It's a brazen strategy. Naming the name of Jesus while openly scorning his teaching of compassion, justice, and inclusion. Waving a Bible in front of a church a church never attended, a Bible never read. Follow the money. That's lesson one. Well, now, the accusation brought against Paul and Silas also have a very contextual feel for me. It was a well-tried way. Uh, it's always been a well-tried way of dealing with those who threaten vested interests. You see, they couldn't very well accuse Paul of healing a deranged woman, that wouldn't look good. Nor of taking the owner's dishonest income. But they could accuse Paul and Silas of being different. They are foreigners with foreign ways, is what they charged about Paul and Silas. And that was enough for a mob to join in including the magistrate. Now, in my part of Africa, xenophobia is exploited to preserve profit. 
All one has to do is to remind people that the shopkeeper who is competing with you comes from Somalia. Or the taxi driver on the same route is from the Congo. <coughs> and that is enough to start a riot. And this should not be strange in the United States. I wonder if you know that since 1607, some 5,000 people have died each year in this country. Not at the hands of war, but the hands of fellow Americans in riots against them because they were minorities of one kind or another. Every group of foreigners landing on these shores has suffered these riots and these abuses. Those who came in chains from Africa, most of all, it has never stopped for them. So when we manage to other a person or other a group, whoever they are and for whatever reason, that gives us permission to bypass human decency and to use them or abuse them at will. So Paul and Silas are dragged to magistrates who actually join in the mob of beating them up. And then they're thrown into jail. Now here's lesson two. Nine times out of 10, the powers that be, the state, the law, will side with commerce and wealth with institutions over individuals. In fact, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some time back, your Supreme Court actually declared that institutions were individuals. So here they are in the deepest prison cell with their feet trapped in stocks, covered in blood and bruises, a horrible, horrible business. No wonder scripture said they were saying their prayers. Who wouldn't say their prayers under those circumstances? But it also says they were singing praises to God. Yes, really. Christians do sing in the strangest places. We sing in graveyards and we sing in prison cells. I've never been beaten black and blue, but I have done a fair bit of singing in prison cells myself, and I can recommend it. It does wonders for your spirit under those circumstances. And I also think of others. I think of Nelson Mandela and his fellow prisoners on Robben Island. Any, anybody here been to Robben Island? Put up your hand. You've seen, you've seen where they were kept? You've seen that long hallway with the, with the doors on each side, the barred doors? Well, when I went there to minister to those, those men, I was not allowed to have them in a group sitting together. I had to walk up and down that hallway and look into each cell while I tried to leave a message of, of hope and encouragement to each one and to meet his eyes and for a moment for, to, to remind him that this, this was not the only thing there was. There was a thing called love and compassion and care. It was hard to preach that way, but there was no problem with the hymns at all. When we started singing, as it were, the walls were broken down and the, the, the roof was lifted, lifted with praise. They sang with gusto and their praise rose to God, unimpeded by the bolts and the bars. And so it was with Paul and Silas long ago. And come to think of it, you know, God has never been very impressed with prisons and jailers. How many jailers in the Bible end up with egg on their face? Think of the stories of Joseph and Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And what about the poor soldiers who guarded the ultimate jail, the tomb of Jesus? And now there's Paul and Silas. So this could be lesson three. God is in the business of opening prison doors, turning power upside down. In 1976, some of us clergy went for a walk. Well, I suppose you, it was a march, really. And we were also grabbed and dumped into some very unhygienic prison cells. There were eight of us in our cell, and we were dressed, uh, I'm afraid, not very practically in our 
clerical collars and cassocks uh, or preaching gowns. The whole po purpose of prison, anyone who's, who's had to endure it will know, is intimidation. Uh, the, the noise, the loud voices, the rattling keys, the clanging doors, the guards in their boots and their leather, their leather belts and their guns and the rest. It's all about power and you're supposed to feel very for, small and intimidated. And so with a slam and a rattle, the officious young guard pushed us into our cell, slammed the door, shoved the big key into the keyhole, and oops, oopsie daisy, would you believe it? The key wouldn't turn. We watched him for a while. He wrestled the key this way, that way, this way again, a little bit that way. The door just wouldn't lock. I thought it was a good moment to speak to him in his own Afrikaans language and remind him of this very Bible story that we're talking about today. And this young white lad in his big uniform began to look less sure of himself. And finally, in words that have could have been written for a comedy script. He said, Achilles Priestus, believe me as a belief that you less only eight comni, which being translated is, look, you people are priests. Please promise me that you won't come out. <laughs> well, the open door allowed us to go around that night and minister to others in that cell block. But the next morning, we were able to offer him our own version of what Paul and Silas said. Don't worry, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. Who is really in charge now? You see, God is in the business of inverting, inverting power. Not always in one night, of course. In the case of our greatest South African, it was 27 years. But that's lesson four. We need not be afraid of prison bars. We need not be afraid of anything that the powerful can do. Because God ultimately is in control and God has a way of bringing down the powerful and lifting up the humble. And I want all of us to pause on how the story ends. Because it ends not with the death of the jailer, but with his baptism and a warm embrace welcoming into the family of faith. See, if the gospel is really to be the gospel, it has to be ultimately about healing. We have a, we have a struggle on our hands. But at the end of the day, that struggle must lead us to a place where somehow we can walk towards those who have been our foes and open our arms towards them and hope that they will enter our embrace. Because God turns power upside down, not in order to prevail over people, but to transform and to heal and to reconcile. That is why after a terrible, bruising liberation struggle in South Africa, we chose truth and reconciliation. And that is why there are people in this country who, in your most divided moment since before your civil war, and believe me, this is the most divided moment since before your civil war, there are people like Vanessa Kirsch, who's here in, in this sanctuary today, who's come to join us, who, and, and her, her team, who I've been talking with on Zoom for two years now about how to build a truth and reconciliation process and a justice process in this beautiful country of yours. You see, way back in Pharaoh's time, that motley group of slaves that Yahweh liberated, they left Egypt for a new land. The trouble is in South Africa, Pharaoh's white tribe and God's liberated slaves had to learn to get on with each other. Nobody was going anywhere. After the struggle, 
they were still there. We had an amazing newspaper editor whose name was Percy Koboza. And Percy Koboza made this statement, I've never forgotten it. He says, you know, if we have a bloodbath in this country, what will we have at the end of it? We'll have a majority of blacks and a minority of whites who will have to get down and learn how to live with each other. He says, well, we've got that now. So why don't we just go around the bloodbath and get on with it right now? The same is true here. The priority is not just to achieve liberation from this nation's original sins of economic and racial and other forms of exploitation and oppression, but how to find each other and set Pharaoh himself free from the chains that bind him, the chains of fear and prejudice and hate. He needs to be liberated from that, as surely as those who he oppresses need to be liberated. Was it Walter Wink who said, the only way to God is through your enemy? Well, I don't know what kind of life you're looking, you're looking for, my friends. I don't know what kind of life you seek as you come into this place today. I hope it isn't a peaceful one. If you want a peaceful life, then try transcendental meditation. Maybe that would do it. But if you follow this Jewish rabbi called Jesus, any day, any time, God can throw you into the path of a demanding, perhaps punishing encounter, clashes between the gospel and some new or old vested interest, some dark challenge to the justice of God or maybe just an ongoing, nagging voice rising up out of the many slaveries that still exist that will not be quiet. I didn't ask to be born a privileged white person in apartheid South Africa, in racist South Africa. But a voice just followed me around, reminding me that I was a servant of the living God and asking what I was going to do about it until I had to do something to shut that voice up. And that changed the shape of my ministry for 40 years. Isn't that the challenge to people of faith in America's crisis right now? What I'm trying to say is that this is a risky place to represent Jesus. Somebody who always knew this was Duke University professor William Herzog, who liked to ask his students, what have you done this week to get you crucified? Next year will be the 60th anniversary of another letter sent from another jail. Not Paul's letter from Philippi, but Martin's letter from a Birmingham jail in Alabama. It was addressed mainly to the silent, comfortable church of his day. And this is what he wrote. Whenever the early Christians entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christians of being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But the Christians pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven called to obey God rather than men. And then he went on to write, things are different now. So often the church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender of the status quo. Well, that letter may be 59 years old now, but it could have been written yesterday of many, perhaps most of the churches in this land. Can it be said that either of your society and mine, the church is acting as a colony of heaven, disturbing and challenging the ongoing inequities, the contemporary slaveries and exploitations of our day? And so King went on, if today's church doesn't recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions 
and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Well, I want you to know, my friends, that it's the 21st century now, and in all my 60 years of ministry, I've never known the churches that I know best to be as disregarded and silent as they are today. It seems we need to be shaken by the kind of earthquake that shook Paul and Silas in Philippi a long time ago. And that's why we must listen carefully for voices that come to disturb our peace. Even if they come from strange people, they may be from surprising directions, but maybe promptings like the insistent cries of a deranged slave girl will remind us day after day that we are supposed to be, all of us, servants of the living God, declaring the way of salvation. And maybe that reminder will irritate us into doing something to cast out the demons that are binding your nation and mine today. Maybe it will disturb us into taking on the powers, even if it means learning to say our prayers and sing God's praises in unexpected and unhygienic places. And then God may surprise us.